I can see John Dredge is in the waiting room a little early. Do we go the, to him? Grant him audience. Do we grant him audience? What if he's, like, getting dressed? Bonus. Bonus? Okay, Bonus. Well, let's, let's, let's admit him. If I Oliver see, Bonus, where he shops. If I see any sign of the downstairs oh. department of John Dredge... No, he's no, closed. Very much we were, upstairs. We were worried, John. And I know I said, you know how this works. You, you, it said half seven. And I said, but we start at seven. Join us whenever. And I, But I was worried because sometimes when I see my clients or when I'm doing stuff on Zoom, quite often, like half an hour before the meeting, I'll get an email saying, Tony has joined your Zoom meeting. I'm like, what? Why, why would Tony do that? Which Tony is that? I don't even King know. Tony. It. No, it's Tony, Tony, Tony from the pop group. Tony, Tony, T I had an argument with someone once who argued that Tony, Tony, Tony were actually called Tony, Tony, Tone. They oh, because they the spelt them in extraordinary ways. Yeah. They the accent. Anyway, this is irrelevant to John. John <laughs> Everything's John. irrelevant. Everything's, stay irrelevant. That's, that's my new motto. It's easy for you to say. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> most of you will know him. Some of you won't. It is our pleasure to admit into the circus of horrors... The one and only um, Mr. Jonathan, or as, as he likes to be called, Tony Dredge. Yeah, I actually saw Tony Blackburn the other day walking along. He's really short. He is short, yeah. He's a short guy. I think I'm they like made really... them especially short for TV so they would fit. <laughs> so they can get in the box. Did you say anything to him? No, I crossed over the other side of the street. He would love it if you spoke he, he to him. Would, he would absolutely have been blown away. Next time. Is that the Are first you, time you've seen him in your entire life? I saw him once at Thorpe Park in 1987. Did you say hello to him then? Uh, yeah, he was really nice to me. <laughs> you should have said. Remember Thorpe Park 36 years ago, Tone? Yeah, yeah. He was so nice to me. I was an annoying little brat then. Wow. Well, we, well, here's an interesting question. Uh, for those who don't know, John is a, a podcaster, a comedian. We're here to talk about the film Splory, which... Uh, it's very, very silly indeed. That's the highest compliment. It also has. Can I? Can I? Um, can I mention how it's got time travel in it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can mention that. Okay, it's got time Good travel. Good job because he did it. Unless we can go back. No, I'm. I'm going to mention it um, this time next week. Okay. Oh, no, I mentioned it. This, to, uh, uh, to, uh, what were you like as a kid? Were you a Were you a pain in the backside? <laughs> I think I was obsessed with television. Really obsessed with television. Right. And radio. Because, uh, you know, I don't think I went out much. You, you don't do you, when you're a kid. You're, you're basically dependent on your parents. So yeah. I think, you know, I just got fascinated by whatever was in my room. You've got nothing else to think about, have you, you know? So I was extremely fascinated by radio and television. I just used to talk about TV all the time, and people just used to throw me out. Top, what, um, did you used to do, your, like, your own radio shows when you were about five? Yeah, yeah. Low-listening figures. <laughs> we, we, we've had lower don't worry <laughs> what's the what's the lowest listening <laughs> you've ever had lowest, i'm telling you my lowest, my lowest viewing out. figure rise the breakfast tv show i did once recorded zero figures and we did worse than noddy that was a big thing in the papers zero figures and worse than noddy so noddy uh, was yeah. good though so don't take it too hard it was it was noddy classic so yeah it was uh it was good favorite shows as a child tv or radio well, TV would be Tiz Was, which I'm I'm still fairly obsessed with. Yeah. Uh, I went to see the reunion they did a, a couple of years ago, and, and Chris Tarrant threw a bucket of water over me, which was like being ordained for me. Wow. I'd have punched uh, him. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure what, what he's like as a person, but it was nice to have a bucket of water okay. thrown over me by him. Um, what else did I like? Well, you know, Hong Kong Fui and... Uh, well, Kenny Everett, who I know you're not a big fan of. Well, I'm not. I, I'm glad Kenny Everett has trod this path before me because he made it possible for me to do some of the very, very dumb, silly stuff that I have done on the radio. Ha however, I, I'm, I'm not a fan. It doesn't tickle my pickle, so to speak. But I respect totally what he was doing. I get frustrated at myself that I don't dig it because I know there's a huge back catalogue. So, um, so I allow you, John, to like him. I think you you have you have similarities you and him. You're you're both quite anarchic. Mm. You're both a bit silly. You both don't like being told what to do. 
I wonder if that's part of the reason I don't like him. I once was in the company of Andy Partridge from XTC. And I said, oh, I've got this band that sounds like XTC. He said, Ian, why would I want to listen to a band that sounds like XTC? I'm in XTC. I don't want to hear anybody that sounds like us. So maybe there's an element of that. Is there a psychological thing that you are everything that you find irritating in other people? I don't mean you. <laughs> One is everything That's you find me. irritating in other people. You're referring to me, not to our wonderful guest, John Dress. One, One is. Okay. Uh, it, John well, is, it, Catherine is, Ian is. It is and, true. When I was studying to be a counsellor, they said, right, pick someone you don't like. I picked... Um, John Dress. Hartley. I picked... Who, go on? You picked me. I picked, I picked Julia Hartley Brewer. And they said, write down three, Good choice. Reasons, Good choice. three reasons you don't like her. And I wrote, um, annoying, obnoxious. I did put racist. And they said, right, those are those are three things that tally with you. Those are three things you possess. <laughs> and they're right. They're right. <laughs> so there is something in that, Catherine. We dislike people partly because they, on some level, remind yeah. us of, of ourselves. Who yeah. do you maybe, hate, John? Maybe That's so. a negative question. I was, C Catherine, you, you were too young for Tiz was, right? Uh, I vaguely remember it. I think I was more swap shop. We weren't allowed Tiz was. Mm. Well, I mean, I wasn't. That was oh. the, that was why it was so interesting to watch because, you know, people, parents didn't like it. They did not like it. They liked Cuddly Noel Edmonds, who sort of based himself on Everett to start with, I think, and then gradually realised that he wasn't funny enough. <laughs> so he did swap shop. We, you know, I was in the audience of Swap Shop once and I sat three feet away from Karen Carpenter. I've, I've told that story so many times. I haven't heard that. Get this right. So they, You're the, the one person. The <laughs> last series of, of Swap Shop, they experimented with having a studio audience. Literally no more than 15 kids, right? Um, but you had to be over 10. And I was nine. And we got to Television Centre and there's these kids. And my, my mum kept saying, you're 10. You're t as I do with my kids now, you're 10 years old. You're, how old are you? I'm 10. You're 10 years old. And then the, the person came out and said, right, um, uh, everybody who's under 10, put your hand up. Oh, my God, my hand is up. So we got sent to a separate room. And when they started, about a third of the way in, when they started showing the uh, Hair Bear Bunch, we were taken downstairs. My sister was there already. And we got to sit and watch the show. And there's two little rows, three little rows of seats. Karen Carpenter, three feet away. Just get this for, for um, uh, a bill. Karen and Richard Carpenter, although he had to go early because he had a migraine, they gave away an Astro Wars. Sarah, oh, I, mean, I had an Astro Wars. Yeah, could have won it from her. Sarah, Sarah Brightman singing Starship Trooper. Bernie she Clifton. was in Hot Gossip. That's the link there. Bernie Clifton and the Ostrich. Bernie Clifton was there. Yeah, yeah. What a bill. Catherine, what a bill. You, If that came up, you'd be up Could it have that. been slightly more 80s? That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> but I thought we weren't allowed to watch Swap Shop because we weren't allowed to watch Game for a Laugh. And I thought it was because my dad worked at the BBC, so he had a contract where we couldn't watch ITV. No, it was just because my mum was a snob. He thought it was common. Yeah, she thought it was common. I'd love to have seen Game for a Laugh. I bet you love Game for a Laugh, John, laugh, John didn't you? Game for a Laugh. I don't know. Jeremy Beadle. I mean, Jeremy Beadle was brilliant on the radio, actually. Yeah. On TV, he sort of became known as this fairly creepy prankster that it was really cool not to like. But he was incredibly popular, wasn't he? He was, he was huge. Have you ever seen, there's a video he made, a VHS, called it's about something like How to Do Pranks at Home. Or something. Now I haven't seen an instructional video, was it? Yeah. <laughs> I I need that. I need that. I haven't get seen it wrong. It. I yeah, haven't yeah, yeah. seen it on its own. But I, there's one of these people that talks over videos, and I can't remember his name. Watched it. It is it is wild. It is it's the it's the soap that makes your face go black. It's the whoopee <laughs> cushion. It's the fly, the dead fly. It's that. Yeah, you the got the telescope. It, yep. <laughs> it's the dead fly in the cereal. It's oh my god! It's incredible. I see if I can. Um, you you guys talk, and I'll see if I can find it. <laughs> well, I, I went in this shop the other day that, that's just opened, but it's made to look old. It's like a traditional sweet shop. It, is it a shoppy? Right? It is ye oldy shoppy. Okay, ye oldy shoppy, and. Uh, I went in there and they had a massive rack of all those old jokes. Ooh. I couldn't believe it. That was the first time I'd seen them 
for, for years. So they had, you know, nail through finger and uh, chewing gum that tastes like vinegar and, you know, fly in sugar cube. Was the, shopkeeper, was the shopkeeper a gentleman who still had a little bit of black tufty hair and a red and black T-shirt? Was he that guy? He was obviously a menace when he was younger. Was he still called Dennis? Exactly, yeah. You used to I get those things a... free with a beano, do you remember? You would get things yeah. like that. An ice yeah. cube with the with the fly in it. You get a Plastic snapper, it was cube. a bit of cardboard, and you went like that, and it made a snapping noise. Yeah. Um so it was a guy called Stuart Millard who watches these videos and, and I will I can't find the, the, the anyway, I'm posting the link for Stuart Millard watching Jeremy Beadle's home pranks. Uh it, it really is. Honestly, it is a wild ride. <laughs> a mayhem. John, now of course. I'm reminded you have two connections with Catherine Boyle. Yes. I sat next to her once when we went to that Frasier thing. You have three? Oh, did you came to that, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was weird. You have, remember he sang Happy Birthday to me? That was weird. Yes. You have I think three. That was a hot day as well, wasn't it, John? If I remember rightly, it was a hot it day. It was really hot, and I was getting cramp because I was yes. wedged in between you and somebody else. And I was thinking, oh my God, I hope I don't get real cramp in the middle of this thing. I start kicking my leg about. Or have to jump up. We Yeah, I was just terrified. I was thinking, God, this is all really quiet and elegant and I'm going to start yelling in a minute. Wow, he just <laughs> described something I did. Remember, he talked then about um, Nicholas Lindhurst being in the reboot of Frasier. I think and he called him Nicky Lindhurst, but yes. Yeah. And about three or four weeks ago, it kicked off on Twitter. Everyone, why is Nicholas Lindhurst in the re... We knew about four years ago, guys. We knew four... Okay, you, in that case... Um, you have two other connections with Catherine Boyle. Do I? Okay. Um, Catherine, do you know both well, of them? I interviewed Dredge <laughs> once. Did you? Yes, when I was trying to inject a little bit of, I don't know, something fun on the radio. I interviewed I you that. in the yeah, afternoon right. show. Or did I interview or did I, hi did I get you in and you were interviewed by someone else? Yeah, yeah, that's what happened. But I thought you were much nicer than the person that was interviewing me. I am. You're correct. Yeah, yeah. What's the other thing? Oh, I used to honk at you sometimes when I drove past on the way to talk radio. I used that to was see it. You... you drove past him more oh. times than is normal. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> and you would both message me. Um, I ju I ju Kath just drove past me and she recognised me. I just drove past Dredge and I honked him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I honked yeah, yeah. him. You have been honked by me. This is true. I'm not going to deny it. Oh, I need that, that on a T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's some merch we could have. Let's let us. It feels weird interviewing you because we know each other. Well, I, I, we've always had some sort of uh, rapport there, I think, and uh, I don't have that with Zoe Ball. What he's yeah. saying is, Ian, you're, you may know each other, but you're more acquaintances than friends. He doesn't like you. Okay, I'm going to try. And catch, <laughs> I'm going to catch. That's him off not guard what I'm then. saying. No, I know. I'm, I'm joking. I'm going to catch him off guard. Go on, I'm always on guard. Catherine, name. Britain's three top male songwriters. Hmm. The Bee Gees. Okay, that's a group. Could you listen to the question? Name <laughs> Britain. All three of them wrote songs. Okay, so that's one, two, three, is it? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go Barry first. Oh, gee. Barry, what I got to <laughs> deal Boris, with, John. Then Robin. the weird one, and then, and then the one with the hat. Okay, those the, the Bee Gees to one side. Okay, we've we've mm. had had our fun. Let's get on to the serious thing. <laughs> no, no, we haven't. Name three. <laughs> I'm glad you the, told the, me. The people that are paying for this crap haven't. Name Britain's three top three? male songwriters. I narrow it down from the 1960s. Paul McCartney. Yep. Mm. Don't then do John would... Lennon and George Harrison. Don't please don't. No, I couldn't because then Ringo would be upset. Um. Paul McCartney, uh, Cat Stevens. You're trying to be clever. Don't be clever. Don't think. Feel. It's like a finger pointed to the way to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger. You miss all the heavenly glory. Just think. Three Britain's three best male songwriters of the 1960s. Go. Beatles. Don't include the Beatles. Just go. Oh. Uh, no, you keep taking a, you keep moving the parameters. No Beatles. Just stop no, with this trickery and no tell me what you want me bands. to say. I want you to say Ray Davies. Hey. <laughs> Where would you put him in the top 10, Catherine? Or um, well, the top 10 Ernie? <laughs> <laughs> the top 10 Catherines. Um, I would say I, I'd, put him, I'd put him after the Bee Gees and the Beatles. John wrote a song with him. 
I put him right at the very top. Okay, now you've just talked over what is an astounding achievement. No, that was huh. great. John, John, you wrote a song with him, right? Yeah, yeah, this yeah. This is true and this is wild. Tell me more. Well, what he used call that? He used to, oh God, I mean, years and years ago, I, uh, my mum saw this article in the paper all about these these courses, these writing courses that they were doing in some far off part of Yorkshire. And it was this big, long article on, on the writing. It was about books, essentially. And then right at the end, in very small print, it said, also songwriting with Ray Davis. <laughs> that was the bit at the end. <laughs> I was like, oh, my also God. Spinal tap. <laughs> I've got to get on that. I've got to get on that. If he's doing a course, I've got to get on that. So I remember, you know, making sure I put the the, the letter in the in the post box, making sure it had gone in. I was just so like obsessed with getting on this course. Anyway, yeah, I got on the thing. There was about ten of us in a barn in Yorkshire, and, uh, and yeah, just like Ray Davis suddenly wanders in. He's about eight foot tall, Ray Davis. Very very slender as well, isn't he? Yeah, Slender. he had to sort of duck to get in the room, really yeah. did. And um, he proceeded to tell us what he thought about songwriting for three days. Wow. He just rambled on, you know, he rambled on whatever he came into his mind about writing songs, which was a lot of what was in his mind, I think. Yeah. I think 90% of his mind was taken up with songwriting. And uh, he would set us tasks so he'd say, he'd suddenly say, oh, can you write a song about dinner by the end of today? I mean, that is pressure. Could you write a song about, I don't know, sunset over Wimbledon? No, Waterloo. Could you do that? <laughs> yeah. So, you had, so he would set you a song task and you had to do it. And did you, did you then have to perform it in front of Ray Davies? Yeah. Ay -ay 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 -ay. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, it was... Luckily, there were a lot of people worse than me. <laughs> That's what you hope for on a course, isn't it? <laughs> the funniest thing was, he was Ray Davis was obsessed with getting you to pare everything down. He was always quoting, you really got me, and saying there were only four lines in it. Mm. Just to pare it down. And there was one kid that played his song that he'd written, and, and it went on forever this thing it just kept going on and on it was more like bob dylan you know it had like the verse had 28 lines in it and then second verse had 30 lines in it it just went on and on and we had to be polite and just listen to this half hour epic you know and in the end ray said for the next task i want you to just write four lines for the verse so the next day he came back with this song it had four lines of the verse and 28 lines in the chorus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, the, the, our, and what we'll do, John, as well, is this is for the patrons. This is for the elite uh, uh, people who are pe prepared to chuck cash at any failing enterprise. Um, but what we'll do is we'll upload this as a separate video so that people can see it. It'll take, it'll take a few days or so, but we'll, we'll put this as a, a free thing to watch. Um but most of the people here now will be aware of some of your work because it kind of it all connects. The, well, now, one of my favourite things you did was the song with the Balcony Shirts band. It's, it was like something come look out Spy Man or something like that. Um, I, yeah. I've, got a whole, I've got a whole mess of trouble. What, I can't remember what it was called. Danger Man. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? It was, um, yeah, I did that with Scott and it was... Uh... It was like I was trying to condense the Ipcrest file into one in three minute song. That was the point of it. Uh, I can't remember what it's called though. Hang on, I'm, I'm, I could have been it. Um, uh, uh, it did really. It, it, that, it was the that's the most successful song I've ever been been involved with. It double was played agent on, working alone. Double double agent working alone. That was it. That's the most successful song I've ever done. It was played on Gary Crowley and Steve Lamar. Yeah, yeah, that was amazing. And that was nuts. Let me considering it was just us. Protect doing 24. It. Let me um, let me drag it over. Let's play a little bit of it because it is um, brilliant. I just got to do a little bit of screen magic. I've just got to do that. This takes me ages to do, so please, please bear with me because it's going to look all wonky on your screen. Don't you worry about that. Because now we're going to go to Zoom screen, and um, I'm going to put myself over here. 
so that people can see you. It all looks a little bit wonky. Don't worry, guys. Uh, let's have let's have some of this. This is uh, this is this is great. Here we go. Can you go, can you hear that, Catherine and John? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay. Yes. Double agent working alone. That's, that's brilliant. Scott is one of my favourite human beings on the planet and I think one of the most talented people out there. But that's genuinely, as a member of the Ruts, that's genuinely a brilliant pop song. Isn't it, Kath? Yeah, it's so good. So how, what, how, did, that, how did that come up with Scott? Did you just like message each other one day and say, should we do a song? Yeah, and um, he, he did a lot of it. I mean, he did... He, he put all the backing together and I yeah. came up with the vocal line and the lyrics. And then I just went down to his shop Yeah. and he's got a working studio in the back of his shop, hasn't he? Yeah. And, uh, it was really funny. And yeah, we basically recruited the rest of the, rest of the band from, from the staff. I, I have, see, hang on, I, honestly, I love this so much. Let's have a, let's just have a little bit. Oh, it's something I never thought I would. Received and understood once more. It's something I never thought I would fulfill. Listen to me. Scott acting, always great to see. Listen to me. <laughs> like a young De Niro. Um, there you go. Short, short lines, John. You got short lines in there. Tight, short lines. Um, in the, and I've said this to you before, and I say it again, you have the voice of a very sweet child. Well, as long as he doesn't want it back, I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Catherine doesn't like my song. Catherine, the thing I've noticed about Catherine... I don't she, like it. I've just noticed that there is a general theme. She's very down on creativity. They get a bit boisterous, don't they, your songs? <laughs> very down on creativity. And uh, so I was, I was kind of reluctant to invite you in, John. I was worried she would... Piss on your chips like she does on mine. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't say that you. on Radio 2, would you? Uh, no. He no, probably I, would, which is why he doesn't work on there. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I was going to get a show on Radio 2 and, and it got taken away from me because I phoned up Victoria Derbyshire and uh, Dwayne Chambers and called him a drugs cheat. Uh, I, had, I had a meeting that, that two days after that booked in to speak to the head of BBC, Radio 2 about getting my own show. Wow. Wow, this is John. You're one of those people, John, who... You're is... one of those people. That sounds like uh, Derek Dennis Jameson. Gordon. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> Name old, old men that, that talk like that. Jameson. All right, let's play it. You're going Norden. I'm going Jameson. Catherine? Increasingly Clarkson. Okay. John? If you're one of those... No, that's, it should be Norden saying that. You if you're you one of those people. Yeah. You can't keep saying Norden. All right. <laughs> that um, is Norden. You've never, ha what I'm trying to say is you've never had that little s shot of luck that everyone needs to get the break. I've had it. Catherine did when she met me. Um, and you've never yeah. had it. And it, it's, no. it's proof that talent doesn't always, isn't always enough. And I just feel I should say that because I do think you're brilliant. And, um, it breaks my heart that you never, you haven't, sorry, breaks my heart that you haven't yet had that lightning bolt of, of yeah. someone doing something with you. It's weird. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And, um, yeah, it's a bit of a shame that, personally speaking, yeah. I think maybe I just don't fit in or something or my timing's off or something like that. You know, but, yeah, that, that's that's why I've made this little short film just to sort of, Prove that I could do it, and I'm not. I really hope you're not feeling bad. I'm not saying it to make you feel bad at all. I just no, want to no, acknowledge no. the fact that that's I accurate. Think, 
you're I think you're great, and and it, it, you know, and it, 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 we all know people who are who are brilliant and haven't you know quite had that that break, and we all know people that are crap that are millionaires for being wallpaper. Sorry. The reason it, can I just go back to the reason I picked up on you for three counties and pu and pushed you for that show was because I went this guy is special, right? He can do oh. everything, and he's doing something extraordinary. And he does it all by himself, all by himself. And I thought that was really special then, and I think it's very special now. Oh, well, thank you very much. I mean, the the question is like, what you know, where where does it fit in 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 the, in the media now? You know, and I don't really watch television much anymore, or listen to very much radio. You know, I don't really feel part of 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 the comedy scene or even the music scene, really. So, I don't know. Do you that made me think of that guy. Um, Who's that guy who had like one hit single and, and that's all he needed? It was Joe a, Dolce. <laughs> is it? I don't know. He, he hasn't done very well either, has he, since then? No. He, you know, he, he reclaimed that song and said it wasn't a comedy song. It was a serious political uh, uh, comment on Italian immigrants. I'm not even joking. He really did. He really did. He was, he was clutching at straws, I think. Very, very yeah. yeah. Um, Joe Dolce, I'm waiting for his comeback. Uh, I'll shut up in place. There's probably millions of people like that, though. You know, they've, they've all got, you know, they've all got a certain skill, and, and it's just not, not ever recognised properly. You know, who knows? I bet you do, John. What song did Joe Dolce shut up your face? Keep off number one. <laughs> Strawberry Fields Forever um, by Candy Flip. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was. Whatever happened to Candy Flip? I bet they're all old men now. Well, they they then kept their next single was um, "I'm the Walrus." Nick, I don't know what it was. No, uh, it was, was it, no it kept someone off off number one. Who oh. did? Uh, Joe Dolce did. Yeah, you it just was told Ultra, me Ultravox Vienna. You're joking me. Kept that's... it off. Kept it off. Yeah. I've I've spoken to Midjour about that. He's about, fine <laughs> about that very incident. Yeah. Have you really? Yeah, he's a really lovely bloke. He's a yeah. really lovely bloke, and he just what, went. I put on Twitter once, I wonder what Mid Jour is doing today. And he got back to me. I love it. Yeah, he's a nice fella. He just said something like, I'm doing the ironing. <laughs> I love it. That, Twitter is a, is a, you know, is a, a horrible, toxic place. Every now and then, you'll, let, you'll uh, I, I, I got in touch with, is it Steve Levine, who used to produce Culture Club, and he produced a Beach Boys album in 1985 which many people think is a dud. I love it. Isn't he the guy that also brought loads of Northern Soul records in? Uh, he, he kind of kick-started that. Or is it a different Steve no, Levine? That's, a, that's another, that's Ian Levine, who's also a All doctor. Oh, right, who, I knew it was a Levine. But I was able to say, it's time Beach Boys 85 got some love. Steve Levine did a great job. And he replied, thanks. Stuff like that yeah. is amazing. Can I just add mine? Yeah, go on, do it, do it. Linda Carter. I mentioned oh. her because people were talking about their favourite, you know, uh, their favourite superheroes. And I said, Linda Carter, you know, she's the reason I swam my 25 metres. My mum promised me a, a Wonder Woman outfit. And I was thinking, about, I was singing the theme tune as, as I swam. <laughs> and not only did she like it, she also quote tweeted me and said something like, we ran so you could swim. <laughs> and she followed me. That's and nice. she just oh. made my year. And you were there, weren't you, Ian? And you yeah, saw me you, burst into you, tears. You started screaming oh. and crying. I thought, oh, my God. Um, Graham very quickly before he goes says talking and not making it I'm off to play other people's songs for drunk people have a brilliant evening loved hearing Dredge interview oh that's, that's nice isn't it it is nice isn't it but yeah, yours was the one show actually that I, I felt I did fit in with what does that yeah. tell you <laughs> I don't know I but to... you know we did a hell of a lot I was just thinking about it today we, we yeah. actually did a hell of a lot we, we, we went to the um, we met that Weird Peter Cook bloke. Do you remember that? We we went to his his evening. That was oh, one of the Rainbow weirdest George. evenings. Yes, you were there. You came yeah, to the, the launch. Rainbow George, the Rainbow George evening. Yeah, that was wild that night, right? There were like weird girls but, there and weird that weird band. Oh. Yeah, it was just nobody had planned anything, and you could tell. And it was almost yeah. impossible to leave without being noticed. That was the worst thing. Well, he he yeah, had done a yeah, gig yeah. before at, at the Camden Ballroom where to, it was free to get in, but you had to pay to get out. And it <laughs> it, it had a very similar vibe to it. But 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 luckily Peter Cook was at that one. <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, what happened to his cassettes in the end? What actually happened to his cassette collection in the they end? They didn't get nice? picked up. I, I emailed them uh, the, the his friend and his nephew. 
uh, maybe a couple of months ago, tentatively, because I didn't want them to dump them on me, but I think they're, they're in storage somewhere. They're in storage. Good, good, good. I mean, some of it came out on a CD, didn't it, once? And it was, was crap. Well, there was half an hour of Peter Cook talking about how to open a can of baked beans. Yeah, yeah. And that was, was the best track. Yeah. Um, let's talk Splurry. This is funny, man. This is funny. Short film. We're going to watch a little. We're going to watch. We're going to watch the first. You comfortable with the first sixty seconds being shown? Yeah. Let's watch. I hate it. I hate it where people go on programs and they say I can't give too much away. I always think, <laughs> well, you haven't given anything away. Why are you on there? <laughs> You're happy to give it all away, right? All uh, of it is to be given away. All right. Let me just set this. Let me just set this up again. So we've got to do this. All right, let's have, well, let's have a little bit of this. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat. Here we go. There he is. Hmm. This is how you start the day right. You're a winner, Andy. A winner. Oh. Watch out. Oh, splurry. What? I, um, Did you just say splory? I meant sorry. So sorry. Please let me... Um... Oh, Nick Hornby. Good author. He sets a lot of his stuff around here. I know. Oh, sorry. Of course you do. I presume you live around here. How do you want to know that? Oh, uh, no reason. No reason. I'm not a stalker. <laughs> stalker? No, I'm just saying I'm not a stalker. Uh, I would never stalk anybody. Least of all you. No offence. It's just... Uh, because I don't know you, <laughs> you're, you're a stranger, you know. If I got to know you, I'd think you were obviously worth stalking, I'm sure, but, uh, you know, well, I'm not a stalker. Though. Is this man bothering you? I was trying to find out where I lived and then he started babbling about being a stalker. No, I was babbling about not being a stalker. Should I phone the police? Don't phone the police. Don't tell me what to do. Look, I honestly have no interest in you. <laughs> well, that's just rude. <laughs> it's so insulting. Oh, sorry. I'll just go, I'll just go. Bye. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> let, me get, let me just get rid of this. Hang on a second. It's always fiddly. And uh, coming out of here, stop share, zoom through people. Uh, that, you know, I, I find it funny because that's the kind of stuff I say in conversations where I just can't stop. The word spaghetti coming out of the mouth, and every time something comes out, I think, no, stop there. Oh no, I think I can fix it. No, nope, I've made it worse. <laughs> and that's that's why I found that bit so funny. That's funny stuff, man. Well, um, awkwardness is is quite funny. I mean, you've always you've always known that, Ian, haven't you? Yes. You you've mean? always got a lot out of awkwardness. What do you mean? Why are you saying that? That's, uh... <laughs> I mean, because sometimes, like, you used to have people on the show and you just basically wouldn't say anything. <laughs> and they'd just be left to, you know, pick up the pieces. You know what I mean? Yeah, and sometimes they would go to the inner monologue and that made it even better. I'm just going to yeah. go... Aw awkwardness is funny, I think. Or is it? And now he's doing it again. Has he gone? Uh, he's up to his old tricks. Oh, I can't believe this. Honestly. I shouldn't have mentioned it. You shouldn't. You literally asked me to do it. <laughs> um, so, so the basic premise is a man says splory when he meant, means to say sorry. That's, that's the premise, right? That's pretty much it. Um... <laughs> And he's embarrassed by it. That's what we've put on the synopsis, yes. <laughs> Why hasn't it been getting into festivals? That's what I don't understand. <laughs> I don't, actually. I'm just going to get it in the, put the link in the chat, dear listener. And if you're watching this interview um, uh, as, as a freebie, then I'm, the link, if you have a little look down, downstairs, the link is going to be there, and I suggest you go and... Click on it. That's um, that's what I suggest you do. And I, you know, we, you remember we made a film. We did make a film um, with uh, the lovely Jeff from Popeye's Designs. Um, that was funny, that, right? It's I get really enthusiastic about stuff and then either do it or don't do it and go, oh, I'm bored now. 
that's how my head works. So we did know, it. I know, yeah. I with know, plans it's... to do more. And then I just went, oh, I'm bored of it now. Yeah. So yeah. I get enthusiastic about things and then either do it or don't do it. Come on, Catherine. You, you we know all me. do that or don't. No, but like, okay. All right, then I'll, I'll let me let me narrow it down a bit. I get really <laughs> enthusiastic about stuff and I and I start it and then get bored really quickly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember, you, <laughs> I think you said to... To me and the director guy, uh, I think on the day of the shoot, you know, he'd gone to all this trouble yeah. getting the car ready. It was all yeah. properly. Was drone. So, and you were just like, I'm not into this now. How <laughs> oh, did I actually say it then? Oh, bloody hell, that's terrible. Ian, keep that in your head. But it's a funny thing. It's, um, uh, what is it? Is it? It's not in French. Is it in French? No, it's got French subtitles, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I was actually watching it. It was the first time I'd watched it for years today. And I actually really liked it. I thought it was I really funny. That, I'm glad we did it. I think it's funny. I get, I, you know, I don't know if you're aware of our good friend Ginger Beard, Mark, and me, Mark, and David Turners, who was in the chat, we came up with an idea for a show, for a TV show that we were going to film, like a sketch show. And it'd be like doing, it would be, there'd be like, it'd be like the 11 o'clock show, but without the nastiness. And it would be like me doing Vox Pops. There was a bit where um, David was, would like, walk, it'd be a lot of hidden camera stuff. And David would walk into Starbucks and go, right, I am the world's hide and seek champion, and I will give a thousand pounds to anybody that can find me. Close your eyes, count to ten, and then he'd just be like hiding behind a chair, and they go, "Well, you're there," and he'd stand up and go, and then just run out. <laughs> stuff like that. There he is. There's stuff like that, and it was gonna, and it would have been great. I know, I just couldn't be bothered. Um, Paul Garner, our friend Paul Garner, came up with a character that I was going to was gonna do. And it would be, you know, like in auctions, you know, like normal little crappy auctions where they're selling, they got this this bookcase in it. And 45, do I hear 47? Do I hear 47? And the character would have been me in a fur coat with a cigar and two, you know, what we used to call brassy blondes on each arm. And I'd walk in and go, one million pounds! <laughs> and then run out. <laughs> And we were going to do all of this stuff. And, okay, here's a question for you, John. Part of the reason I could I, I didn't do it is because I thought that's going to be a lot of work. At yeah. tops, it's going to get watched by 100, uh, 825 people. These things are a lot of work. There's no yeah. doubt about it. People don't realise exactly how much work there is involved in little, tiny little creative things, like like little films. You know, it just yeah. it is a hell of a slog. Yeah. And I... Um, I, I struggled, and that's part of the, the lack of motivation for me. I keep having ideas, and I just think, 600 people are going to watch it. You know, we went and did some Vox Pops in London, and I thought they were really funny. I think we got 1,000 views, which is quite a lot for stuff on my channel. I just, I guess I, maybe for me, it's the, the, I don't have that need. I don't have that need to do stuff. I'm guessing you still have that need, right? I don't know why I, don't know why I did I just thought, I think everything just sort of fell into place with this thing. Yeah, I met I met this director because he, he he was looking for actors to do some silly comedy. So I appeared in this thing that he did, and I thought this guy's really funny. And it's sort of rare for me to meet people who I think are really funny. Yeah. And he was really good at film as well. I mean, you saw, you know, he, he made the thing you just shown there, and he knows what he's doing. Yeah. And um, so I thought, right, I want to do something with that because I know it would be good. I think that was the thing. It was. It seemed like a straightforward thing to do and the organization wasn't that difficult it sort of fell into place you know sometimes things just yeah. fall into place and that was that was really good um it's very funny it's free to watch on youtube if maybe you're listening to a podcast just type in splory and dredge uh and it comes up and i i, I guarantee you it's, it's like seven minutes, 15 seconds of your life that you will thoroughly enjoy and will laugh and will think is silly. And once time travel got involved in it, John, I'm a sucker for that stuff. I was like, oh, my God, this is actually all right. This is actually brilliant. It's, it's sci fi, guys. Dredge goes sci fi. Are you a big sci-fi person then? I'm a big time travel man. I love time travel movies. That's that's the thing that gets me. Um um, uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Oh, I saw um, someone mentioned these. Does anyone in the chat know these um, Trancer films? There's a character called Jack Death in it, and he travels through time. I've just downloaded some, and I'll be watching those after the show. 
tonight. Um, you're not a you... Doctor Who. You're not a Doctor Who person. Uh, you know, um, mm. when I was not means. when I was six, my dad who worked at the BBC took me to the BBC, and we they used to call them crash bars, and they look like little canteens. And I'm sat there. I'm six. Tom Baker strides in, in the garb, walks over to me and kneels down, and said, "Do you like Doctor Who?" <laughs> yes. Do you hide behind the sofa when you watch it? Yes. <laughs> so do I. And then, <laughs> and then he gave me. Didn't have any jelly babies. He gave me two cubes of sugar. Flipping heck, man. Six years old, that, you know, that blew my mind. So I like classic Doctor Who. I don't like the new Doctor Who. It's a bit CBBS for me. Yeah, Tom Baker, what a, what an eccentric, what a, what a lovable eccentric he, what he is. Still Have you is. read his autobiography? I've heard it's a bit weird. No, I haven't read it. That's one of the few <laughs> autobiographies I have not read. Mate, uh, yeah, yeah, it's weird. It's weird. It talks about him trying to literally trying to murder his mother-in-law. It's it's a read. <laughs> Dredge, we've talked about Splory. Um, Thank you. Thanks for that. You're very welcome. Oh, somebody, somebody made what I found odd was somebody sort of reviewed it and said that they thought it was a bit like something Chris Seavey would have come out with. Right. I, I don't know too much about Chris Seavey, but it just seemed odd that they mentioned him because we. You first put me onto his stuff. Yeah, I can see that. I can see a bit of, bit of Chris influence. I could imagine your character played by Frank, actually, Frank Sidebottom. It, Maybe that's what they meant. With with with, um, not saying you look like him. That would be rude. With a few little subtle changes, that could have been Frank. <laughs> Get, you right. know, mixing it up. Um, I got to watch that film again. I got to watch. Um, well, that, that we went to see that. Yeah, that's a great film. I need to watch that again. Podcast, podcast, podcasts. That's your cue to talk about any podcast you got. Um, <laughs> As you slip ever more into the darkness, understand. have you turned? Yeah. Is someone well, turning the dimmer switch down on you? Or? Papa meow meow <laughs> says, "Does John own a candle?" And I was going to ask, "Do you have lamps in your flat?" Or uh, well, I'll, I'll try and turn. A, you know, we're, we're trying to save money here. <laughs> Some, uh, uh, let's have a look. Let's get a torch and put it on your chin. Oh, my uh, God! Is that better or worse? That's that's beautiful. That What's is... funny was you didn't say anything about it. <laughs> I was watching it. I was thinking, how dark is it going to get before we have to say? I was thinking, are they going to notice it or not? <laughs> it would have been really funny if it just went totally to black. You know? Well, I did. I did. As I was typing in Dredge, it came up you on David Hepworth's uh, show. And I thought, oh, turn the lights on for Hepworth, did he? Won't do it for us. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. David Hepworth. Oh, God. Right. I mean, that was a, that was a, that was good to be on. That it was really good to be on that. He's, he's quite opinionated, isn't he? I don't I uh, I don't really know if I'm completely honest. Don't forget this video is going to go public. He's very opinionated, and, and that's they're good opinions. They're all good opinions. Uh, they're all justified. <laughs> Pod, you've got podcasts, right? Coming out of the wazoo, I believe. Well, <laughs> not last time I looked. Oh. But um, I haven't looked. So I'm doing, yeah, I'm, I, I've spent five years writing a bloody podcast series. Why have I done that? You know, uh, it's uh, comedy sketches and things like that. Um, it's a new series of something called the Nothing to Do with Anything show which is a bit Python-esque and silly. It's just all pointless. I mean, it's like the the film, it's like there's no point to it. It's just silly and hopefully it's funny. There's no message at all. Uh, it's just a bit of fun. People, and it took five I, years to write. When I call things silly, people see it as an insult. It's not. It's not at all. We we need more. You know that the 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 arm. I haven't watched Python for so long, but the army character Graham Chapman. All right, stop this now. It's all a bit silly. Yeah, that, more silliness, please. Everything's so heavy and grey. Let's have let's have silliness. Let's have. So, what's the point of that? There isn't one. That's yeah. okay, man. I was like like Rick Mayall said that when he came up with a character called Kevin Turvey. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But he said he, he just wanted to do a, a character, that, a character that, was that was sort of pointless and wasted television time. <laughs> that I, was I, great. What I, a great I, idea for a character. I won't tell you that when I was 10 years old, my mum took me and my sister to see The Young Ones Live and Kevin Turvey was the opening act. And I also won't tell you that I stood on the set of The Young Ones flat. 
because that would be bragging and that's not what we do here. Um, Dredge, it's lovely to see you, man. Um, Thank you for having me, man. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. We'll put this up as a freebie. It, it, it will take a week or so because I'm so unmotivated in anything in my life. Um, oh, Player Wellknown says, John, I have a vague memory of listening to one of your podcasts a few years ago with the word custard in the title. I very much enjoyed it. That sounds like me. Do you remember when you pushed the wheelbarrow around on, on the stage? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was... Uh, that. That, that was took a lot favorite. of preparation. That was my favourite thing that night. That actually went quite well, didn't it? That was really good, that. That was amazing, that. It was amazing when you used to put on those those uh, performance ring nights, yeah. They, they were fun, and we did we did quite a few. Do you remember? Uh, I don't want to speak ill of anyone. Everyone was brave to get up on there. But do you remember that um, there was a very nervous guy, I don't know if you were there for this one, John, who was giving like a – he used to give guided tours, and he was giving a talk, and it, it went on for – it was slow – and it wasn't really connecting and it went on for a long time and I had to do that. I had to get up and go, oh. okay, well, um, listen, I'm going to have to interrupt now. And it was, it was so uncomfortable. <laughs> and, but it's funny because you, you were, so, I remember you were sort of encouraging us from the audience. And so that was really good. It was fun. They were fun. And then we did about three or four of them. It wasn't set the agenda. What was it? Performance ring. And then we had a bit of um like a, a thing where we thought, oh, shit, we're making money from this. And I think we, in the last one, we did pay people like 20 quid each or something. Anyway, they were a lot of fun. Then I lost uh, momentum. John Dredge. Thank you, we guys. And we applaud. And now, how does this I look? I look forward to honking you again soon. Sorry? <laughs> Are you going to leave or do I kick you out? What's the best way to do this so everyone looks cool? Can you say, hi, yeah, like Miss Piggy and kick me out that, that way? Oh, oh, okay. But hang on, I've got a to... Hang on. Um, remove. Okay. Remove. Hi! 